Welcome to Airworks Paragliding Club Pilot Theory. We divide the theory lecture into four sections, air law, principles of flight, meteorology and airmanship. So starting with air law, when you're planning to fly, it's important that you choose not to drink too much the night before. The legal limit is 20 milligrams of alcohol per 100 ml of blood, which is a quarter of the drink drive limit. In the morning before flying, you should check NOTAMs. I usually use notaminfo.com to get a map of the NOTAMs. These are notices to airmen telling you about airspace restrictions or any other things of interest. You may then choose to use the Civil Advanced Notification Procedure to notify other air users of your presence. If you do so, the notice appears on military flight crew briefing boards approximately four hours after the call, and although they will be encouraged to give you uh, private airspace, it does not guarantee this. It does just guarantee that they know of your existence. UK aviation law is defined in air navigation, the order and the regulations. This is summarised in the document CAP 393. Additionally, the CIA periodically issue air information circulars and then NOTAMs are issued on an ad hoc basis. Any radio you use must be type approved by the CIA. The glider owner or operator must have a station license. Then the pilot must either personally hold a flight radio telephony license, or if they do not, they must use only frequency 118.675 or the other listed sport aviation frequencies providing it's not possible for them to change frequency in flight. It's a legal requirement that all aircraft are inspected once a day before flight and also that pre-flight checks are carried out. It's a legal requirement that the forecast weather conditions are checked and confirmed acceptable. And likewise that all pilots and passengers are in a fit state to fly. Geordie's cat. The BHPA require that all students under training are aware of the Geordie's cat and bike. Will Geordie have his cat aboard today? W. Wind and weather. G. Glider. H. Helmet. Next H. Harness. C. Controls. A. All clear. And T. Turn direction. However, this is not the mnemonic that we prefer to use in the school or after this. A better mnemonic is pilot heeding his responsibility has clearance to depart. Before picking up the harness, you check your parachute, handles and pins. Before putting on the harness, you check your helmet is on and secure. Never put a helmet on without doing it up. It's easy to forget doing it up if you do so. You then check your harness, starting at the bottom, make sure your legs are secure, then your waist strap, then your chest strap, also ensuring that the speed bar and risers are not trapped by any of the straps. You then check the reserve, making sure that the pins are remaining after you've put the harness on. Then check your hang points. Are you attached to the glider? The lines are not twisted, knotted. The hang points is everything connecting you to the side. You would then check controls, that they're not twisted or jammed. And turn direction, which way am I going to turn on takeoff, immediately after takeoff? So turn direction means, am I going to twist right or left because I'm reverse launching? But it also um, means am I going to turn right or left to avoid any traffic or to enter into my chosen sorting pattern. 
Immediately before launch, we would then use the one-way ticket mnemonic, obstacles, wind or weather, and traffic. These are checked in sequence um, of the slowest thing that changes. Obstacles change relatively slowly, wind changes more quickly, and obviously traffic changes uh, moment by moment. Where in the school environment a parachute is not fitted, we will often use the HHH mnemonic. Helmet, is it on and secure? Harness, uh, is it done up properly, etc. And hang points, are you attached and clear? Uh, are the controls not twisted or jammed? Which way would you need to turn to unravel the hang points? And then finishing with the one way ticket as before obstacles, wind, and traffic. The CAA control all civil aviation in the UK. Rule one is that all pilots are responsible for not crashing. So look before you manoeuvre, and even if you are in the right, avoid a collision at all costs. Aircraft on the ground are the lowest form of aviation and give way to everything else. Head to head, you should always break right. If you're flying head-to-head -head with another aircraft and there's a ridge involved, your first thought should be brake right. If you are the aircraft with the ridge to your right, obviously you may not wish to get any closer to the ridge. Therefore, if you are the aircraft with the ridge to your left, you should anticipate having to fly all the way around the other glider. So, in summary, Head to head, break right, and if the ridge is on your right, get as close as you are comfortable with. Overtaking, when there's a ridge involved, you may overtake on either side, but bear in mind that at all times the overtaking craft must keep. In open air, it is best practice to overtake to the right. <coughs> Converging aircraft where both aircraft are flying towards the same point, the aircraft on the right is in the right. So if you look over your right shoulder and see an aircraft there, they have right of way, and you should turn to avoid them. Convergent aircraft, there are rules of precedence. Powered aircraft give way to airships, gliders and balloons. Airships, give way to gliders and balloons, and gliders give way to balloons. Both paragliders and paramotors are considered to be gliders. When landing, we give way to lower aircraft. This is the only time that height is referenced in air law collision avoidance. When you're following a ground feature, you should keep it to your left. In other words, fly on the right side. But remember, you are the pedestrian on the motorway. All other air users will also be flying to the right of a ground feature. So the best practice is not to follow a ground feature. If you're flying over a built-up area, you must be more than a thousand feet above any object within 600 meters. So a thousand feet above the highest fixed object within 600 meters horizontally. You must also always be high enough to glide clear to a safe land. Flying over an open air assembly is permitted, providing you maintain a thousand feet vertical clearance and, of course, enough height to glide clear in the event of a power unit failure. You may not land or launch within a thousand meters of any organized open air assembly of more than a thousand persons unless you abide by various rules which are unlikely to be in your favour. You must not fly within 500 feet of any person, vehicle, vessel or structure except when you are taking off, landing or ridge soaring. You may drop only fine dry sand or water, in other words ballast, nothing else. Do be very careful to ensure that you have checked that there is no temporary airspace on your intended route. A Cessna pilot was jailed 
for two years for reckless endangerment of an aircraft after flying through Red Arrow's display at Eastbourne Air Show. We generally operate in visual meteorological conditions and in fact in relaxed visual meteorological conditions, provided we are under 3,000 feet, travelling at less than 140 knots, all we need to be is clear of cloud, in sight of the ground, with 1,500 metre visibility. There are full visual meteorological conditions for each set of airspace, the A, B, C, B, E, F, and G. Um, check out the CAA table for the full definitions, but you don't really need to know that for clear. Airspace is shown in an air chart. There are half mil charts which usually show all airspace and quarter mil charts which only show the bottom portion of the airspace. So that with a lower limit below 5,000 feet or flight level 55. In the UK, airspace is divided into categories. Categories A to D require air traffic control clearance. Category E you may enter providing you maintain full VMC, not relaxed VMC. And categories F and G are the so-called uncontrolled airspace. They are not subject to air traffic control clearance, but they are riddled with small areas within which you may not fly, such as aerodrome traffic zones, danger areas, restricted areas, prohibited areas. The difference between F and G is that in category F airspace, a radar separation scheme is provided for um, craft that are participating. Civil daylight is 30 minutes before sunrise until 30 minutes after sunset at ground level. And that's the key. If you're flying at 10,000 feet watching a beautiful sunset, by the time that the sun has set, it will be properly dark at ground level. So be very aware of the daylight level on the ground. We are allowed to fly at night, provided the correct lights are shown, but it is incredibly dangerous, but I don't do it. Airspace is measured in a variety of ways. QFE, we call it query field elevation, how high are you above your airfield? QNH, query nautical height, uh, how high are you above the mean sea level? And QNE, standard altitude, how high are you above the international standard atmosphere as a zero? The airspace measurement QFE is largely only useful in the bar. How high did I get above takeoff? QNH is very useful for avoiding um, ATZs, prohibited zones, danger areas, and the like. Um, QNE is particularly useful for avoiding the higher airspace. A change in altitude of 30 feet will reduce pressure by one millibar. ATZs or aerodrome traffic zones are a little bit of private airspace that many of the larger small airfields have. They have standard dimensions, two nautical mile radius, 2,000 feet high. If the runway is longer than 1,800 meters, then it's two and a half nautical mile radius, private airspace. Do not penetrate an ATZ. If you find you have accidentally penetrated an ATZ, then your best uh, course of action is to join the circuit and land, claiming that you have an emergency force landing. Maybe you've got a bug in your eye. Don't penetrate the airspace and then thermal away. They will send a police helicopter after you. Here we see a military air traffic zone, a MATS, which you may legally penetrate, but it's going to be full of bombs and helicopters and goodness what else. Within the MATS is an ATZ. In this case, it's the larger style, two and a half meters per mile one, which you may not penetrate. And also, you will see off to the uh, bottom right, uh, a standard sized civil aerodrome with, with its own ATZ, which again, you may not penetrate. Military air traffic zones have standard dimensions. They are five nautical mile radius, and they have one or more panhandlers, which are five nautical miles long, four nautical miles wide, and 2,000 feet thick. 
So there's a 1,000 foot corridor underneath them through which you can fly. You may observe an area of blue diamonds on your chart. This is an area of intense aerial activity and AIAA, which is legal but busy. Danger areas, magenta hatching on the chart. Anything that's magenta hatched, generally speaking, is something you can't go. A danger area is only prohibited when it's active. However, you do want to make sure that A, it's inactive, and B, you don't land on the range, because there could be unexploded munitions. This particular danger area is danger area 11, which runs from the surface to 10,000 feet, and occasionally 24,100 feet. The height of the terrain varies between like, 2,038, 1,983 feet, and, and down. Prohibited areas. This is prohibited area number 106. And as always, it goes from the surface up to 2,500 feet. Here's a restricted area. Restricted area 104, surface to 2,400. The convention when thermaling is to enter thermals in the same direction of rotation as any glider that is already in the 360. You must join at a tangent. Don't fly straight at the core. Start from outside and work your way gradually in. On local sites, there is a club rule that you should thermal clockwise until you're at least a thousand feet above tape. When in clear air, away from the ridge, then the thermaline pilot is given right of way by convention. However, if the thermal starts to drift into ridge soaring traffic, you should assume that ridge soaring traffic is less competent and therefore the thermaline pilot should aim to give way to the ridge soaring traffic. Obviously, the first glider in a thermal sets the direction of rotation. But when two thermals merge, one may be going in a different direction to the other. In this case, then the gliders that are in the highest thermal should maintain their direction and the lower gliders should change to that same direction. Locally, if there is a glider in your thermal turning to the left, in contravention of the local club rule, and you wish to join that pilot in the thermal, you must join rotating left. Um, air law and collision avoidance and convention overrule the club rules, even though the club rule is there for your benefit and safety. When thermaling, our convention is to give way to lower aircraft. This is because we are high-winged aircraft and can't see up very well. Sailplane convention is to give way to higher aircraft because they can see above more easily. If you're thermaling a paraglider, however, and you're below another glider, if you're following along behind them, you cannot expect them to give way to you because they won't be able to see you. If you are thermally inside another glider, you can also expect to be given right of way because you can't force a glider to turn tighter than it will without spinning. Head to head, break right. Head to head with the ridge involved, break right. But obviously the person with the ridge to the right should not be forced into the hill. Overtaking, you may overtake on either side, provided you maintain a safe clearance from the other aircraft. However, why not just turn back? It's usually easier. In open air, you should overtake to the right. Convergent aircraft, where you are both flying towards the same point. If the aircraft are of the same class, then the aircraft on the right has right of way, and the one to the left should give way. Theoretically, were the aircraft on the right a Cessna, they would not have right of way over you as a paraglider. However, in practice, I would not expect uh, a, any other aircraft on my right to give way 
I would always give way to an aircraft on the right. Principles of flight. A flat plate inclined to an airstream will generate lift, provided it is given that incline, the angle of attack. You will generate a positive air pressure beneath the plate and a reduced pressure above the plate. The area of reduced pressure above the plate may be enhanced by the use of an aerofoil section. An aerofoil section basically forms one half, the bottom half, of a venturi, accelerating the airflow over the top of the wing and thereby enhancing the reduction in the static pressure. So the airflow over the top of the wing is accelerated because total pressure must remain the same. With increased dynamic pressure, something has to give and that is static pressure. The opposite happens underneath the wing and there is an increase in pressure generating a buoyancy effect causing the wing to generate lift. The airflow over the top of the wing does not meet the airflow coming from underneath the wing at the trailing edge. They are slightly displaced. At maximum glide, maximum lift drag ratio, approximately, and it's very approximately, two thirds of the lift is due to the venturi effect reducing the pressure above the wing. If you increase your angle of attack too much, the smooth airflow over the top of the wing may begin to detach from the airfoil, generating turbulence. If you continue to increase the angle of attack, the airflow over the wing will completely break up and the wing will be said to have stalled. You can see from the image on the right the classic croissant shape of a stalled paraglider. It takes maybe 100 metres to recover a full stall, dynamic stall. So you shouldn't be doing this in flight in Sussex. You're never going to be high enough to recover. Drag. The act of pulling our wing through the air, our lines and ourselves, generates parasitic drag. Parasitic drag is the sum of profile drag, skin friction and so on. This increases with the square of velocity, W square, quadruple the drag, parasitic drag. Induced drag is generated from the act of generating lift. Very simplistically, if we think of it as generating the wingtip vortices and allowing the air to pass from the high pressure underneath of the wing to the low pressure upper surface to do so. The faster we go, the less time the air has to escape from the high pressure area around the wingtip to the low pressure area, and thus the less induced drag is caused. This is a simplification of it. Induced drag reduces at approximately a square rate. If you add both drag curves together, you end up with the total drag curve shown here in green. This curve has a low point, which is the point of greatest efficiency of your wing. And for gliding flight, that is considered to be maximum lift-drag ratio or maximum glide. For powered flight, that would be cruise, the speed at which you would aim to fly around the sky for greatest efficiency. The only useful thing that you bring to your aerofoil is your weight. Your weight acts downwards through the centre of pressure, the point through which all forces are said to act, pulling the glider down and hence forwards. The drag acts in opposition to your direction of travel to both hold you up and backwards. Lift acts at 90 degrees to drag to hold you up and pull you forwards. If you add lift and drag together, you will end up with a resultant which in steady state flight is equal to and opposite to your weight. The ratio of lift to drag thus defines 
the angle of your glide. If lift to drag is 9 it's to 1, then we go hours. 9 meters forwards for every meter we go down. The 9 to 1 going down. Relativity. We have wind speed, air speed, and ground speed. If you're standing on the ground, feeling the air move past you, then that's the wind speed. If you're flying, all you can possibly feel on your face is the air speed. And your glider doesn't care what the ground is doing beneath you. All it needs is air speed to fly. Say your brake setting is demanding an air speed of 20 miles an hour. If you're flying downwind in a 15 mile an hour airstream, wind speed, you would have a ground speed of 35 miles an hour. Were you to turn into wind, your ground speed would change down to 5 miles an hour. Your airspeed, of course, will remain constant at 20 miles an hour. Clearly, it would be much easier to launch and to land by running 45 miles an hour rather than 30 miles an hour. Consequently, it's a good idea to both launch and land into wind. This is a polar curve. There are six aircraft here, but you can only see four of them. This graph is a graph of your forward speed versus your sink rate. To the left of the blue glider was a black glider. Unfortunately, he was trying to fly at stall speed and has stalled and fallen off the paper. The pilot flying the blue glider is flying at minimum maneuvering speed. That is the slowest speed at which it is safe to try and maneuver around the sky. And you should never fly slower than that speed. The pilot flying the green glider is flying at minimum sink speed. He's flying for the greatest duration flight. Not necessarily the greatest distance. This is the speed to fly at when you're thermally, trying to gain height, or when you're ridge soaring, trying to gain height. The pilot flying the yellow glider is flying at maximum glide. That's the speed to get the furthest in still air. The pilot flying the red glider is flying at VNE. In practice, paragliders don't actually have a VNE, certainly not a placarded one. You put your hands up, you press the bar out, and it goes as fast as it goes. But hand gliders and fixed wing aircraft often have a specified velocity never exceed, so that the wings don't fall off. Uh, and there was another black glider flying faster than the red one, but he did exceed VNE and his wings fell off, so he too has fallen off the paper. The more weight you add to your glider, you increase both your vertical and horizontal speed, maintaining the same glide angle. You increase your collapse resistance, though you do make recovery more dynamic. The less weight you carry, the less stable your glider is, the less your forwards and vertical speeds are, and ultimately it's possible that should anything go wrong with the glider, it may actually not recover. For this reason, you should never fly too light on your glider, never fly below the certified weight range. Use of the accelerator or speed bar lowers the angle of attack, increasing the risk of deflation and because you're going faster, making the recoveries more dramatic. However, the accelerator does allow you to go faster than hands up alone and were you trying to cover ground into a headwind, you should use the speed bar or accelerator system to go as fast as is appropriate for interwind flight. Here we see the glide path of the green glider flying at minimum sink speed, the highest point on the graph. You will observe that there is an area above the graph. Here we see the flight path of the glider flying at maximum glide angle, max LD ratio, and you can see that there is no area above the graph. Here we see the optimal speed for a glider trying
travelling into a 30 knot headwind. This particular glider needs to travel at over 60 knots. Equally, if you were in 3 metres a second sink, that's the same for this glider as a 30 knot headwind, and its best speed to fly is 60 odd knots. You can combine some headwind and some sink to find an optimal speed for any given conditions if you know the polar curve of your glider. But in practice, with a paraglider, the speed range is not very extensive and the penalty for flying too slow is far greater than the penalty for flying too fast in terms of performance and therefore it is always better to err on the side of going faster rather than too slow. However, of course, remember that using the accelerator does make you more prone to deflation, so should be avoided in turbulent conditions or when near the ground. Rapid descent techniques. A good rapid descent technique is big ears, but it's not very rapid. You can make it come down faster by using the accelerator at the same time. And the good thing with big ears and speed bar together is that the accelerator lowers the angle of attack, whereas the big ears increase the angle of attack. Big ears increase the risk of stall, but the accelerator reduces it. Net result is it's okay. Big ears make the glider more stable. Accelerator makes it less stable. So again, add the two together and it comes out reasonable. So big ears and speed bar together are very good for particularly running away from big scary clouds and getting down in a rush without doing anything too dramatic. It does of course reduce your control because you can't steer with the brakes while you put big ears in because your hands are busy. Always put your big ears in one at a time and release them symmetrically, just let go. But don't pump them out, let them come out on their own. If they don't come out spontaneously, then weight shift first one way then the other. Set up an oscillation and that will usually bring them out. If that doesn't turn one way then the other. You don't want to pump them out because you could stall the glider. Another rapid descent technique is the bee line stall. Reach up, take your bee risers and pull them down. It's quite an aggressive manoeuvre because you are stopping the wing from flying. But having said that, it's a relatively low stress manoeuvre. You just reach up and pull. The glider gradually slows down. Once it's slowed down enough, you'll find you can then displace the gliders, in other words, actually move them down. And the glider will drop into a, a nice, normally very stable beeline stall. If it starts to thrash about, should you suffer an asymmetric deflation, aim to maintain a safe course. With most modern gliders, this is achieved by just gently weight shifting away from the deflation and maybe applying 10 centimetres of brake on the flying side. Usually, the deflation will have recovered. If it doesn't spontaneously recover, you might choose to pump it out. And to do so, it's full length applications of the brake on the deflated side. So down 1000, up on the deflated side to recover or pump out the deflation. Be careful not to apply too much brake to the good side because it's very important we don't stall the flying side. If the deflation is more than about 60%, normally it is safest to allow the glider to rotate at least 90 degrees and to dive forwards before you attempt to correct the course. Were you to attempt to correct the course with a very large deflation, there is an enhanced risk that you will stall the remaining wing. If you have a symmetrical deflation, on most normal ENA, ENB, paragliders, recovery is affected by simply putting your hands up. Glider will recover explosively and fly up as if nothing had happened. ENC gliders are prone to having the symmetrical deflation remain in. And if you observe that your glider is prone to this, or that on any wing, a symmetrical deflation has not recovered, you should give it a large pump on both brakes to attempt to recover the deflation. Big pump, hands up, see if it flies. If that hasn't corrected it, try once more. Another big pump, hands up, let it fly. If it's still not recovered, throw your parachute. 
The reason you throw your parachute before all forward speed has been lost is because were you to wait until the glider had deep stalled, your parachute risks going in amongst the wreckage and not deploying properly. In any event, if you have a big deflation anywhere near the ground, within a thousand feet, say, if it doesn't recover as you expect it, when you expect it, throw your parachute. Don't pile up the wreckage to the scene of the accident. Stalls. Full and dynamic stalls only occur because the pilot has pulled the brakes too much or the back rises. It is possible that the glider, if the back line, if the brakes are released too quickly, will surge forwards massively, leading to secondary problems. So, how would you recover a stall? Well, most importantly, you hold the brakes on, tucking your feet in, unlike this pilot in the picture, until the glider is back above your head. Once it is back above your head, you would aim to bring your hands to the back fly position, which is just above the carabiners. Then, once the glider has entered back fly, go all the way hands up. If in doubt, go to the carabiners and then hands up. If there is an aggressive dive, you may damp the dive to prevent any further deflations. But remember to put your hands up again to let the glider continue gathering speed up to normal flight speed. A spin only occurs when the pilot too pulls too much on one brake or one riser. Basically you've stalled one side. It's a very characteristic skidding on ice sensation and the moment you feel it you should put your hands up straight away. Familiarity with both stalls and spins can be gained on the ground. You can identify the stall point of your glider quite readily in perfect safety with both feet firmly on the ground. Active flying is of course an important technique to avoid deflations, but in so doing it's important that you don't bring your hands down so far and for so long that the glider is caused to stall or spin. A pilot flying actively will suffer far fewer deflations than a pilot flying like a sack of spots. But either way, an SIV course, refreshed frequently, can help you live a lot longer if you continue paragliding. There are three fundamental sorts of harness. The open harness, which has a seat plate, no cross bracing, and a chest strap, now known as the waist strap. The open harness, however, can be quite tiring. You get a lot of feedback, and you do get dropped in one side or the other in an asymmetric deflation. To reduce this, they came out with the cross brace harness. Unfortunately, it offers next to no feedback and weight shift is difficult. Consequently, collapses are more likely and it's inefficient in the turn and therefore spins are more likely as the pilot demands at a high rate of turn by pulling away ever more brake. It does give you a little bit of support in a certain range of asymmetric deflations, but thankfully, cross brace harnesses are no longer certified and are very unlikely to appear in the new market. Beware if you're buying anything second hand, of course. Most modern harnesses are variations on the automatic bracing system, which offers a proportional feedback and resistance. Harness settings. Your waist strap is critical setting is critical to your safety. If you set it too wide, you may encounter violent feedback, strong weight shift and good collapse resistance, but if you have a, an enhanced risk of spiral stability and if you weight shift a long way of line twists. If the waist strap is too tight, feedback is reduced, weight shift is too, collapse resistance is weakened and again you get a risk of line twists. So you must set it approximately where the manufacturer tells you to. Head to head, break right. Head to head with a bridge involved, break right. But obviously, the person with the bridge to the right should not be forced into the hill. Overtaking, you may overtake on either side, provided you maintain a safe clearance from the other aircraft. 
However, why not just turn back? It's usually easier. In open air, you should overtake to the right. Conversion aircraft, where you are both flying towards the same point. If the aircraft are of the same class, then the aircraft on the right has right of way and the one to the left should give way. Theoretically, were the aircraft on the right a Cessna, they would not have right of way over you as a paraglider. However, in practice, I would not expect a, a, any other aircraft on my right to give way. I would always give way to an aircraft on the right. Meteorology. Finding some safe air to fly. Airflow, finding lift and forecasting. Most, import most important thing about meteorology is the air is the biggest hazard you're going to meet, but you can't see it. So you've got to second guess it from information available either from the internet or by watching weather forecasts. Wind gradient is the increase of wind speed with height. Strictly speaking, it's a decrease of wind speed as you get nearer to a surface. On the ground, there is no wind. At 10 meters above the ground, the airflow has accelerated to the, that which has been forecast in the normal BBC forecast. And up at 2,000 feet is what we call the gradient wind, above which the air has not been influenced by the land at all. When air is passing over a hill or other obstruction, the body of air in front of the hill is squeezed and accelerated over the top. This phenomenon is known as the Venturi effect, and it's the same as would happen on your wing. So on the top of a hill, the pressure is reduced and the velocity is increased. Anywhere that the air in front of the hill is going up faster than your glider sink rate is considered to be the lift band. So if you want to get out of the lift band, you can either fly it back a little and above the flat top of the hill so that you can settle down on top land or out the front to the lower wind area of the bottom landing field. Behind the hill or any obstruction, you may well encounter turbulence if the fall of the ground is such that the airflow can't cling to it, turbulence or rotor. Importantly, if it's a bit breezy on top, you may go down to, to launch, may go down the slope to launch, provided it's not too breezy on top. If it's too windy on top, by walking down to launch, you risk being blown back into any rotor that may exist behind the hill. Remember, if it's too windy on top, if you walk down the hill and launch, you're just going to go up and backwards and into that area where it's too windy. So rotor and turbulence can be downwind of any obstacle, be it a tree, a mountain or a farm building can extend up to 10 times the height of the obstacle in, in duration. And the easiest way is to visualise how water in a stream would flow over and around the obstructions. And that's pretty much how air does. When wind is blowing square onto a, a nice steep ridge, as long as it's nice and smoothly rounded, we'll have nice smooth airflow and we'll have lift. Once the air and if incidence is about 45 degrees or worse, then it will run along the ridge rather than up it, so it won't generate any ridge lift. On a bowl, you'll find that the air spills out in all directions, so a windsock on top of the hill will not necessarily give you a true idea of the wind in the, in the landing area. Furthermore, what the wind will do is focus in the area that is um, square to the wind direction and will be reduced in the areas that are at an angle to the wind direction. What this does mean, however, is that a ridge is more tolerant of a, a, range, of wind, ring, a range of wind directions than a, uh, a ridge. So a bowl is more tolerant of differing wind directions than a ridge is. A convex hill, such as Mount Caburn, has very little area where the air is forcibly deflected upwards so ridge lift is limited, and most of the wind tends to pass around the hill, causing a lot of wind in the landing area, certainly Mount Cap. Here we see a more complex and more realistic scenario, uh, not entirely unlike Devil's Dyke or Mirror Ridge image thereof. Um, you have 
things in front of the slope, in this case a, a small ridge, a small knoll, which will generate turbulence. Now that turbulence or rotor can detach and it can easily drift up the hill and, and impact that yellow paraglider. So he's not in the best place. You don't want to be close to the ground above such a ground feature. Um, you've got the area with the blue arrow where the airflow is unimpeded ahead and where there's no issues on top. So that's where he really ought to be landing. Uh, and further to his left, you have the Devil's Dyke behind the hill where it's properly rotoring, so you certainly don't want to be low or on a windy day anywhere near that area. Here we see the ultimate ridge, a cliff. Now a cliff, because it's not got that smooth transition in and out of the slope, uh, you end up with a rotor at the top of the cliff. Occasionally you'll even get a rotor at the bottom, although that does usually require a bay to, to generate it. Normally at the bottom of the cliff the wind will either blow one way or the other. Um, the steeper the ridge, the better the lift, the more the air is going vertically upwards. But you've got to find your way around the rotors. Don't land on the top of the cliff. Where we do at top land and launch on cliff sites is where it's tumbled down, where it's not, strictly speaking, a cliff. The worst case of all is the arete. On an arete, it's quite possible that you can be on the wrong side of the hill and feel the wind blowing up the hill and in your face. Thinking that you're on the right side, you take off, climb up, only to meet extreme turbulence where the two air masses meet. So, when you're launching on an erect, if you're in any doubt whatsoever, go to the top to determine the wind direction. Thermals. Sun heats the ground. The ground then heats the air by conduction, um, which then warms up, expanding, becoming less dense so it starts to float up. It will initially just pool as a layer of light and warm air uh, until either it reaches the trigger temperature, which is typically three to six degrees, or if something triggers it, a bunch of sheep running around a field uh, or it meeting uh, an aerial or some other ridge, something that just disturbs its steady state. Once it has released, it will rise so long as it remains less dense than the surroundings. The thermal, a dry thermal, cools at three degrees per thousand feet. The environmental lapse rate is two degrees per thousand feet, typically, approximately. So any thermal, as it's cooling faster than its environment, will eventually, typically, cool down to a point where it stops going up. If that thermal reaches the dew point before it runs out of steam, it will form a cloud. Once it's formed a cloud, its lapse rate decreases to one and a half degrees per thousand feet. You'll notice that this is half a degree uh, lower than a typical environmental lapse rate. And therefore, once a cloud has formed, it goes up faster than it was going up before the cloud formed. So often the big cloud will generate its own lift and it will generate suck. So we have trains, plane. So, wind on launch, you would measure it with an anemometer. If it's a low average wind speed, then it's inherently safe, there's no energy in the system. If it's a low variation, then that means the airflow is smooth, there's not too much thermal activity or mechanical turbulence. If there's a high average speed, say 18 to 19 miles an hour, then it has the potential to be rough because there's a lot of energy in the system. Any rotor generators will be rotoring and so on. But it's not necessarily unflyable. Uh, a sea cliff, for instance, might be very nice in those conditions. However, if you find high variation, say 7 to 15 miles an hour, then that's inherently rough and therefore more dangerous. It's telling you that the wind strength is changing. If it's a sinusoidal change, then that's probably thermal activity. Um, if it's a step change, then it's turbulence, and nobody wants to fly in that level of mechanical turbulence. So, wind on a thermic mounting launch. According to the BHPA, and actually this is utter rubbish, I'm afraid, um, you should not launch into a thermal gust. You should wait for light wind 
and then Alpine Launch. Once you've completed your exam and are thinking of coming out to a thermic mountain site with us, ask again and we'll tell you what you're really supposed to do. Clouds. So what forms clouds? Clouds are formed by water condensing. This can be caused by orographic effects, oros, the earth, moving the air, so elevating the air typically, to form clouds. So we'll have orographic cloud forms, banner clouds, hill fogs and the like. If when you're flying you notice wisps of clouds start to form below you, that means it's quite likely to bloom into a full orographic cloud shortly, so you should immediately land. Don't wait to see if it does form fog. What else can cause clouds? Convective lifting. Here we see some beautiful spring cumulus clouds marking the top of thermals. You can see they've not risen too much, so they're obviously meeting a slightly warmer layer at the cloud top. Unfortunately, on that particular day, you can tell by the flags that it was too windy for us to fly. Here we see a typical stratiform cloud, just a grey layer. Here we see cirrus clouds. Cirrus means curl. And they're the very high ice clouds. All the clouds at that height are so named. Nimbostratus. Nimbus means rain, so nimbostratus, raining stratus clouds. Fern, where air has been mechanically pushed up a mountain, it's deposited precipitation on the windward side, and then it's pouring over the leeward side of the mountain falling down like a waterfall. As the air falls, it's deposited moisture at the top. As it falls, it's warming up and accelerate it's warming up but accelerating downwards. It's very unstable a very stable air which is very turbulent. If you see or hear a firm in the forecast, don't fly. Here we see some wave clouds, lenticular clouds, very characteristic lens shape and a sort of ice cream smooth shape to them. Of structure to them. You can see small scraggy bits of cumulus here. Now in the picture of course they're still but the small scraggy bits would have been moving fast so they're known as scud whereas the wave clouds would have been stationary. Here we see lenticular clouds with a classic cigar shaped rotor cloud beneath. The concern with lenticular clouds is they only form when it's windy uh, and if it feels like it's not windy, it could be that you're in a certain portion of the wave so that you're not exposed to the true wind strength. The mid-layer clouds, the alto clouds, alto stratus, alto cumulus, etc. In the UK, don't really have a great impact on our weather apart from to filter the sunlight and moderate thermal activity. Here we see cumulonimbus clouds uh, with cumulocastellanus or Marge Simpsons beneath. If you see those Marge Simpsons forming, they're a warning sign that cumulonimbus will develop by the end of the day. In a high pressure system, there's literally a heap of air and it's slowly descending to equalise. So this descending air prevents the formation of cloud, so we have unimpeded insulation, which in turn forms lots of thermals, but because they meet this descending air, all they succeed in achieving is to increase the level of inversion and to bring the temperature of the lower 2,000 or so feet to a uniform high temperature which eventually will form thunderstorms as it, as it finishes itself off. That's the summer. In the winter, that uh, same lack of cloud allows heat to escape far. Low pressure, there's literally a hollow in the atmosphere, and so the air is flowing in 
to equalise that hollow, fill it up. Um, so air is all going up. So we get lots of cloud formation, cumulonimbus, nimbostratus, etc. Um, virtually no sunlight, but the air is very unstable. The air is wanting to go up. A little too much for us, so in the depths of a low, it's usually too stormy for us to fly paragliders. We want something a bit... Here we see the top view of a high pressure and a low pressure. Um, above 2,000 feet, the air is flowing parallel to the isobars. Only below 2,000 feet does the air flow in or out of the weather system. In a high pressure system, it's obviously flowing outwards, and in a low pressure, flowing inwards. That 2,000 foot high is known as the gradient wind. Let's just say it's normally. Right, above 2,000 feet we have a gradient wind, above which it's flowing parallel to the ice bar. Below 2,000 feet it flows in or out, typically at about 30 degrees to the ice bars. Um, so as you go up, the wind direction changes right with height. And if you were to stand your back to the wind, you have low pressure on your left hand side. So think of the L form of the thumb and the finger. It's low pressure on the left hand side if your back is to the wind in the northern hemisphere and it's the other way around in the sun. Here we see the life cycle of a depression. We have the polar front, cold air above, warm air below. A perturbation sets up, forming a wave. Um, we end up with a warm front and a cold front. Cold fronts move faster, so the cold front catches up to the warm front, closing it off and causing an occluded front, after which the front will end, after which the weather system will end. Too complicated. Here we see a cold front with associated cumulonimbus clouds, so it's an intense cold front. Moving fast, so we get sudden wall of cloud approaching, heavy precipitation, but brief, an hour or two at most. Um, once it's gone, typically it's cold, clear air, and good flying. Post cold front, traditionally, it's said to be good flying conditions. Here we have a warm front. Warm air sliding over the top of cold air and squeezing it out of the way. Um, the first signs, two or three days ahead, we'll see alto cirrus, uh, sorry, cirrus, um, cirrus stratus, and steadily lowering cloud form, cloud layers. Um, with the first sign, one of the first signs is a halo around the sun, as that thin layer of cirrus just reflects and, and forms a sort of a rainbow feature around the sun. We get moderate precipitation, but it can last for a day or two rather than the hour or two of a cold front. And once it's passed, we have warm air, poor visibility, and high humidity. Post warm front generally not that. So an occluded front is where typically the cold front catches up to the warm front, elevating a body of warm air, which just rains and rains and rains. Um, if you get an occluded front stuck over you, just go shopping because you're not going to go flying. Here we see a sea breeze cell. Sun shines on the ground, generating thermals. Thermals rise, generating a low pressure. We call that the heat low. That air, that rising air, then forms a high pressure uh, above the land, high above the land. It then flows out to sea, cooling as it goes and descending. It descends over the ocean and then starts to flow back in towards that low pressure. Fairly quickly it sets up a, a fully rotating, recirculating cell, known as the sea breeze cell. Head to head, you should always break right. If you're flying head to head with another aircraft and there's a ridge involved, your first thought should be break right. If you are the aircraft with the ridge to your right, obviously you may not wish to get any closer to the ridge. Therefore, if you are the aircraft with the ridge to your left, you should anticipate having to fly all the way around the other glider. So, in summary, head to head, break right, and if the ridge is on your right, get as close as you are comfortable with. Overtaking, when there's a ridge involved, you may overtake on a 
either side, but bear in mind that at all times the overtaking craft must keep. In open air, it is best practice to overtake to the right. <coughs> Converging aircraft, where both aircraft are flying towards the same point, the aircraft on the right is in the right. So if you look over your right shoulder and see an aircraft there, they have right of way and you should turn to avoid them. Airmanship. There are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there are no old, bold pilots, except the ones that only learned a few weeks ago and do learn from the mistakes of others. Do not 360 anywhere near the hill. Do not fly back the hill. A downwind landing or arrival into rising ground can, if you're lucky, be fatal. If you find you have taken off with a line knot or tangle, try to get clear of the ground and any other traffic before taking corrective action. Weight shift and or counter brake to the opposite side to get yourself out to the position of safety and then pump the knot itself your brake. Pumping with the brake may be the optimum or pulling individual lines may be the optimum. Uh, don't fly so slowly that you spin um, and if the knot or tangle is too tight to clear, clear, then go and turn to the bottom, make a safe landing. Be prepared if necessary to throw your parachute. Always have a safe landing field within easy glide. Never fly where you cannot reach a safe landing area within an easy glide. Always assess the weather before flight, but most importantly, while you're flying. Strive constantly to improve your flying, seek advice, Having sought the advice, make your own decisions. Don't just become one of the flock. Always have that good bottom landing option and always have a multiple plan, A, B, C and D. Keep thinking, think on your feet, think on the fly. Constant aspect landing approach, typically how you would land an aeroplane. You have a downwind leg and a base crosswind leg and then finals. So you set up upwind of your field, fly downwind to the end of the field if you're very high, you can fly further away from the field. Trying to maintain a constant, say, 45 degree aspect down to the landing area. When you get to your turn for your base leg, if you find you're a bit short, you can cut the corner. Or you can fly a longer base leg if you're still high. And finally, a straight-ish flight final to land. In strong winds, set up at the windward edge of your chosen field. You may consider using big as a speed bar to get down. You need to be into the PLF position at at least 100 feet above the ground. Because if you do have a deflation, you will not get yourself into PLF position. So be there ready and waiting. S turns, drifting backwards into the landing field, are a perfectly rational way of doing it. Having landed, you may wish to use your D-risers to collapse the glider. If, however, you've got it wrong and you're being dragged, take just one brake and hand over hand down that brake line until you get to the canopy. Having stopped it, though, run towards the glider and grab it. Only then are you safe, and even then you're not truly safe. It's only once you're at the glider that you are. Top landings. We always approach top landing on a slow beat, so unless the wind is square on the hill, there's always going to be a fast leg and a slow leg. So always come in for the top landing on the slow beat. According to the BHPA, you should approach with just enough brake to feel what the glider's doing. Uh, you must be certain not to go so far back that you risk dri dropping into any rotor. You should complete your turn into wind, even at the last moment, or even after landing, if necessary. Try to turn quite flat. Don't, you don't want one hand up, one hand down. Try and keep the turn uh, under control. Don't mush in if you're too high. If you're too high, just do another circuit until you are low enough to land. If in doubt, bottom land. If you're getting blown back, then point into wind, hands up, full bar, see if you move forwards. If you do, all well and good. If you can't do that, then you've got to consider your escape options. Generally, turning and flying off the side of the hill would be safest. Uh, but if that's not possible, then point into wind, slow down to minimum sink speed, 
and allow the glider to go backwards, gaining height. Once you stop climbing, you then turn and fly away, again, preferably off to the side, but if that's not an option, then turn downwind and try to outrun the rotor. Chances are you would not outrun the rotor, but were you to meet another hill en route, that might be enough to change the airflow. Trees. We land in the biggest tree available, because you don't want to hit the tree, fall out and hit the ground. First of all, if you are going to land in the tree, arrive in an orderly manner if possible. So come in, flare, etc. But as soon as you have flared and you're slowing down into the tree, you release the flare, cross your arms and legs, so arms in front of you facing the A-brace, legs crossed to protect the femoral arteries, and releasing the flare to allow the glider to then overfly the tree to stop you falling out. As soon as you slow down, grab something. And once you've got that something, hang on to it. If you've then got bits of webbing and carabiners and what have you available to you in your harness, then clip yourself onto the tree and wait. Don't attempt to self-recover. It's when you're most likely to hurt yourself. Water landings. Treating water landings as if they're probable suicide is a very good idea. Do anything possible to avoid a water landing. However, if a water landing is inevitable, then first of all, unclip all your harness straps so you're just sat in the seat. You may or may not wish to remove your boots depending on what the beach is like. Um, don't land in the surf. Better to land further out than to land in the surf and get tumbled up with your glider. We land downwind, allowing the glider to overfly. By landing downwind, with the glider going nose down onto the water, the water seals the leading edge of the wing, uh, keeps it inflated, allowing the wind, if there is any, to keep the lines taut and reduce your chance of entanglement. As soon as you touch the water, A brace over your face and forward roll out the harness and swim away. If you're anywhere near the beach, make for the beach. If you're miles away from the beach, stay near your glider because it's a lot easier to Glider certification. First and foremost, do not change your glider. Don't shorten the brakes or tie off a speed bar or anything like that. Um, Germany have a legal system, LTF, it's a, a law, um, and they certify gliders as LTF 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, or 3. Um, this used to be performed by an outfit, a commercial operation called DHV, but now there's a few certifying bodies. Rest of Europe, uh, test to CEN, Central European Normalization 966, the N 966, and they'll categorize gliders as A, B, C, or D. Roughly speaking, an A is an equivalent to a DHV or LTF1, a B is roughly a 1, 2, a C. Towing is a further conversion course, usually it only takes a day or so. Um, you may tow up to 60 metres without a permit from the CAA. Um, if you have a permit, it will tell you how high you can tow. Um, most important of all, do not try static kiting. Static kiting is where you tie yourself to a fixed object with a bit of rope in a breeze and see if you can fly. You will fly, but what will almost certainly happen is what would happen to any single line kite. As it goes offline, you won't be able to correct it and it will just turn upside down and nose you into the ground. 180 miles an hour. So do not tie yourself to a fixed object. Starter, your ab initio, you move on to elementary pilot, still needing the services of an instructor, and then you get to club pilot. You can fly club sites, um, and you may use at this juncture the services of a coach. Um, once you've got to club pilot, you can then train a paramotor. Um, in fact, nowadays you can train for paramotor from elementary pilot. But you still, however, need to get to pilot before you're allowed to fly cross country. Uh, and from pilot, you can then become a training instructor and or a tandem pilot. BHPA require that you keep a logbook as evidence for your further ratings, etc. They require that you keep to club and site rules, that you display a red ribbon until you've got at least 10 hours. If it's too crowded, you shouldn't launch. 
Because if you're flying it's becoming too crowded, you are part of the problem, so you should consider landing. What you could do, however, is ask about a red ribbon half hour, um, whereby we only have the inexperienced. Best practice is that you should get ready away from launch, particularly if it's a crowded launch, and only approach launch once you're clipped in, holding your mushroom glider ready to lay out and go. Having launched, you should clear the vicinity of launch quickly to allow others room to get off. Don't perform acro in front of the queue when you're trying to, to jump the queue when you're trying to land, and equally you don't perform acro in front of launch. Um, what I mean by that is the lowest glider has right of way. So if you're in a queue of 10 gliders coming to land, don't do some spiral dive to jump the queue because the person um, that's about to land might be uh, phased by your sudden appearance. Having landed, clear the landing area quickly and move to a packing area. And don't land in the packing area. Don't land where it's bad for them. Flying abroad. First of all, you should keep a logbook, um, both if you're flying in the UK and abroad, um, because you might be questioned as to whether you are good enough to fly a certain, such a site. Um, it's a good idea to get yourself an IPI card before you go abroad. It's about a tenner from the BHPA, um, International Pilot Proficiency Identification Card. Uh, until you're familiar with the milieu in which you're about to fly, you should use the services of an instructor, not a coach or a guide. Um, you should be aware that rules may differ and that weather will have local issues. There could be valley winds or glassy winds or all sorts to confuse the issue. You should consider not flying during the strongest part of the day. In the UK, we, we commonly expect to fly all day long. In, in Europe, it's normal for lower air time, probably not to be able to fly from about 10 to 6 o'clock. That's the norm. Uh, most important of all, observe any local laws. BHPA require that you wear a helmet, and you should put your helmet on and secure it before you get clipped in. They provide third-party insurance, um, which is a requirement of most landowners. Uh, BHPA require that you file an incident report for all accidents or near misses and equipment failures. And in the case of a fatal accident, you should also advise the police and the BHPA will forward um, the, your incident report to the Air Accident Investigation Board. As a club pilot, you should use club coaches. We do provide them for your use. Um, while you're an EP, you still need the services of an instructor. Only once you're club pilot may you fly unsupervised. And if a pilot, then you're allowed to fly cross-country or advanced pilot then you can fly in competitions. Instruments, various instruments you might care to use. Anemometer to measure your wind speed or of course if you're holding it when you're flying your airspeed. A vario to measure your climb and sink rates, um, usually just go beep. Uh, and an altimeter measuring your height using air pressure. The usual scenario is to have your vario and altimeter combined in one unit. It's a very good idea to have a GPS um, it gives you your location, which is nice for cross country, but also you can get your ground speed from it, and from that you can work out the wind speed, even when you're too far from the ground to, to get an idea of it. Uh, radios, uh, the two meter radios that most people use uh, are actually not legal, they're not illegal, but they're not legal. Uh, what you should use are airband radios, type approved by the CAA. Head to head you should always break right. If you're flying head-to-head -head with another aircraft and there's a ridge involved, your first thought should be break right. If you are the aircraft with the ridge to your right, obviously you may not wish to get any closer to the ridge. Therefore, if you are the aircraft with the ridge to your left, you should anticipate having to fly all the way around the other glider. So, in summary, head to head, right right, and if the ridge is on your right, get as close as you are comfortable with. Overtaking, when there's a ridge involved, you may overtake on either side, but bear in mind that at all times the overtaking craft must keep. In open air, it is best practice to overtake to the right. <coughs> Converging aircraft, where both aircraft are flying towards the same point, the aircraft on the right 
is in the right. So if you look over your right shoulder and see an aircraft there, they have right of way, and you should turn to avoid them. 